Hi, hello, everyone. Welcome to Fat Mascara, a podcast about beauty culture. I'm Jen Sullivan. She's Jess Matlin. She'll be here in a second. It is Friday big interview day, but it's our last summer Friday here at Fat Mascara. It's our last summer Friday in general for everyone, I guess. Monday is Labor Day. I hope everybody's summer was amazing. For me, honestly, I don't even need a calendar to tell me what time of year it is. You know, I'm attuned to the seasons and the birds that are around. I'm not going to get into my birds. We're not doing birds again. It's not a birding podcast. It's a beauty podcast, but you know what else tells me what season it is? My skin. It was literally this week that I started feeling really dry again, and I'm not going to rant about that. You've all heard it, but anytime I'm feeling dry, you know who I think of? Sean Garrett. There's interviews we've had on Fat Mascara where like just people will pop into my ear like someone we've had on the show with a piece of advice at like an opportune moment in my life. Sean just pops into my ear all the time whenever I'm dry, giving me that moisture sandwich advice. He is the person who introduced us to that concept back in the summer of 2022 when this interview was first recorded. But Sean is a New York-based esthetician, Dior's skincare expert, and just an all-around delightful guy. So we have that interview for you today. We're going to talk about his story and how he became an esthetician. He's going to give us some excellent skincare advice, and we'll just celebrate his wonderful Virgo energy since it is Virgo season after all. So let's get into it. Sean Garrett, you are literally glowing. You're drinking a matcha tea, matcha latte, a matcha something. What is your life like right now? For those of us who don't know you, tell us about your life. My life is, I, don't know, I feel like things are aligning like where they should be. Like okay. with work, I'm very happy with work for the first time in a long time. I'm like getting my health in order. Like I have mm-hmm. new doctors. So I'm like up on my health again, which mm-hmm. I kind of neglected for so many years because I was focusing on work. Okay. And like, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm dating, I'm going out. My social life is good. My work life is good. My money is good. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know? so it sounds like it was, it was, this was hard one and it was like, you started from the bottom maybe? Yeah. Like the bottom of the bottom. The bottom of the bottom. The bottom okay. of the bottom. So tell us about that. Well, I come from Baltimore, Maryland. You mm-hmm. know, it's like a, it's a small town. Very, very small. Everyone knows everyone. It's a tough city to grow up in. Especially in Baltimore City, you know, it's a lot of crime. It's a lot of drugs. It's tough living, honestly. And it's mostly because of you know, the circumstances that the people that live in these you know, specific areas kind of have to go through. You know, the city really doesn't get a lot of help. And so a lot of people suffer there and they kind of hustle for a lot of what they get. I grew up in a really amazing family and I was really taught like a strong work, eth- work ethic from like the time I was little. And so I was always like a hustler, a driver, driven, and always was like career oriented. Mm -hmm. And so even when I was super, super young, my mom really instilled in me to figure out what I wanted to do so that I wouldn't have to end up like a lot of people that were in our neighborhood at the time. Yeah. And, you know, my grandma worked like, you know, two, three jobs and she ran like a summer camp, a Christian summer camp program that I used to go to. (laughs) And, you know, my mom... You know, I've seen, like, I think, like, since I was little, I remember my mom was in school, like, my whole life. Like, she was always in school, getting new degrees, leveling up, getting new positions to, you know, take care of us and get my brothers in a better position. And it really just drove me to figure out what I wanted to do. And it took a long time, I think, for me to really figure out where I wanted to be, what my passion was, and what, like, what was going to be the thing that really kind of drove me to, I guess, find the career that I really wanted. And luckily it was skincare and it was kind of always skin and it was always beauty. I just kind of always avoided it. And then when I finally just kind of gave into it, it worked out. How did you land on that? Like how old were you? Like when did you discover skincare? What was that moment? I discovered skincare very, very young. I mean, I grew up in a house full of women. All of the women in my family are like very glamorous girls. They're very glam. You know, it's hair, nails, makeup, wardrobe. You know, I come from a very 
you know, beautiful family, not to, you know, toot our horn, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, growing up, all of like my aunts and my mom, especially my grandmother had huge vanities of product, you know, makeup, nails. I remember my grandmother, she wore the same nail color, just like me. We were like, I wear the same nail color for like years and hers was like this i think it was called like champagne toast it was like this like champagne mm-hmm. gold she used to get her nails done every like seven days to the day and just like her perfume and her jewelry it just always inspired me and so fashion and beauty was always something i was attracted to and i knew i wanted to do and i actually was like obsessed with hair but i was like hair is too complicated and if you fuck someone's hair up, that's the end of your career. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> so, you know, clothes, you know, fashion, you can always fuck that up, you know, fix it. And then you see them at church and you're like, I didn't do that. Literally. <laughs> that is so funny. I've never heard someone, like, physician hair that way. And I'm like, oh, my God, what, like, a surgeon or hairstylist. Both sound scary. No. You know? Literally, if you're a surgeon, like if you fuck someone's boobs up, you're done. If you fuck someone's face up, you're done. Their hair, like you're done. <laughs> Especially in the the city I grew up in, one bad review, like girl, you have to move out of state. Like start <laughs> no more over. customers. <laughs> no customers. You have to like work at the post office. Hair is done for you. <gasps> and so, like, I always loved hair and makeup, and but I really always loved clothes. When I was young, I was very artistic. I used to sketch and draw all the time. I remember when I was, like, 12 years old, I, like, sketched, like, my first blueprints for a store that I wanted to open. And along with my family being glamorous, they're all very artistic. My aunt, she was a jazz singer, sang background for a lot of famous artists. My aunts were like sculptors and designers and painters. And so I was always immersed around beauty and art. And I knew I wanted that to be a part of my life. It's what made me happy. And I kind of found beauty After kind of transitioning out of fashion, I worked in fashion for a little bit. I didn't have like a huge career in it. It was a lot of assisting and working at showrooms and things like that. And I just didn't see a long-term career for me in that specific industry. And I started to get into makeup. I think it was around like 2013, 2014, the kind of beauty industry really started to blow up, especially on like YouTube. You saw so many makeup gurus and- you saw the first kind of wave of what a beauty influencer was around that time. And like Jaclyn Hill and Patrick Starr, and, you know, they were collaborating with brands like Becca. And I was like, oh, I can do this. You know, I was like naturally good at makeup. And when I would do makeup, my focus was always skin. I never really cared about crazy eyeshadow or like editorial makeup. I wanted to have people... I wanted to give people perfect skin. I wanted to make them look glowy and beautiful because I think that's kind of the foundation of makeup. We want to just have like a beautiful glowing palette Mm -hmm. and then we kind of add everything else on. And so that was always like natural glowing skin was kind of like my signature doing makeup. And during that time, I would always preach to my clients about skincare because they always be like, oh, I have this texture. I have to get rid of this hyperpigmentation. I want full coverage. And I'm like, girl, if you use a glycolic acid, you know, you wouldn't have to pound on, you know, so <laughs> so much makeup, you know, like get a glycolic, yeah. get a good cleanser, you know, use sunscreen. And one of my clients, when I was living in LA freelancing, she was like, why don't you become a fucking facialist? Like, I'm tired of you always <laughs> in my ass about my skincare. <laughs> you my have ass. beautiful skin. You're obsessed with skincare. Like, why don't you just be a facialist? And I was like, girl, like, there's no such, like, Black girls aren't estheticians because you just didn't see that. And every spa I went to, it was always like, you know, Polish, Russian girls. I mean, like supermodels that were giving facials, basically. (laughs) And so I never really thought it was like something I could be successful in. And at that time, I was like trying to make money. I was freelancing. I was doing like hair campaigns, makeup on hair campaigns, like little music videos and things like that. And like some things happened in L.A. that just didn't like work out. And I was kind of in a point where it was like, I had just turned 25 and I was in a transition of where, what am I doing with my life? I was really like, I have to find something that is going to be sustainable for me. And so I left Los Angeles. I moved to Atlanta with my mom, who was living there at the time. And I was like, I'm going to take this time to regroup, figure out where I want to go, where I want to be. Like, I'm tired of moving around. I'm tired of like 
freelancing. Like I want a real career that I'm happy with. And literally like a week with being in Atlanta, something just clicked to me and was like, go to aesthetic school. It's the perfect place. You know, you have some time. And literally I made that decision. Me and my mom went to go see schools. I found the best program there and I enrolled. I started a summer accelerated program. And so I started like June of 2017 and I was in aesthetic school from nine to six, Monday through Friday. I was working at Ulta Beauty on the weekends, still doing makeup and selling products. And so I was like working seven days a week. Like I was not playing like I had a goal and as I got further into it like I was just so good at it <laughs> like I just... so how did you jump from okay this 2017 is like not that long ago and it's not that far after you have a studio and you're working on Rihanna yeah we, connect the dots for me there like I don't I honestly don't know oh uh, think I, think, I, think hard you're on fat <laughs> mascara <laughs> <laughs> like, honestly, like, and I, I say this all the time, but like, once I made that decision to move into skincare, I really feel like that was my purpose because once I entered skincare, like it unlocked something into me where I was fulfilled in so many different ways. It wasn't just finding like a career or success because I didn't have success, you know, immediately. It took some time. I think it really was unlocking what I really wanted to do in life, which was help people. You know, the thing that really inspires me about my job is like making people feel good about themselves. You know, Mm -hmm. it's a transfer of energy that I always talk about in a facial where I really kind of like can take someone who's stressed and upset about maybe their skin or something that's going on in their life that's causing skin issues. And I'm almost coming as like a skin therapist and using my energy and my hands and my skills to kind of lift that from them and give them the tools to kind of maybe help something in their life as well. I don't think people really understand how much beauty is connected to how much we move in life, in our everyday life. You know, if we don't feel good, our skin isn't good, we're dealing with like cystic acne and hyperpigmentation, or we're having medical issues like PCOS that cause, you know, facial hair growth and hyperpigmentation and things we cannot feel like we can't control, it really affects how we move and present ourselves in the world. And I feel like as a facialist, I've been able to help alleviate some of that for my clients. And I feel like that's like my purpose, connecting with people, helping people find solutions for issues that they've kind of been struggling with. And it really is like, I think me and you talked about that when I gave you a facial, like when I'm in the room, people tell me all of their business. I mean, Hmm. celebrities, uh, you know, Hmm. influencers, normal people. Like you learn so much about people because they're in a relaxed state. And when your energy is right, people feel comfortable and open to letting that up and sometimes release things that they never felt like that was even inside of them. So it's it's really... It's It's a trust. It is. It's a trust with like your esthetician. The same way like, you know, you trust your hairstylist and, you know, your therapist. It really is kind of that thing. You know, I literally say like I'm a service provider. I'm providing a service beyond just a facial. It's really being like an emotional support with my clients, which is why I think now I love my job because that was a lot emotionally for me being a facialist. You know, I've seen a lot of clients multiple days a week. And were you doing facials at Ulta? Like when did you start doing professional facials at smaller spas and then you opened your own? Yeah. So after school, it was really hard for me to get a job. I graduated from Atlanta. I had a 4.0. I had really done really, really well in school. They actually asked me to come speak at my school last year, but I couldn't because of COVID and stuff. But When I graduated, it was very hard for me to find a job because I lived outside of Atlanta and I didn't have a car. And so it was like the odds were against me. (laughs) And I was so excited to start working. But when I would go on to interviews, because I was like, if I have to catch, I mean, when I was in school, I was getting up every day at 530, catching two buses and a train to get to school by nine o'clock. And I was like, if I have to do that to work and build my resume, then that's what I'll have to do. So I would go literally travel two hours into the city, into like these spas and things and even ones that were closer and no one wanted to hire me. And a lot of it was because I was black and a lot of it because I was a male esthetician and it was kind of like a double negative. And then I was black, male and gay in the South. And so it just really wasn't 
it wasn't easy getting a job. And you would think in Atlanta, like, oh, it's fine. But it still has its issues because a lot of these spas are still, like, you know, white-owned by, like, you know, white women who have them. And it's really hard to open a business unless you have, like, you know, your own studio, which I ended up opening later. But basically, I got frustrated with kind of getting the door slammed in my face a lot. And I realized I'm going to have to move to just a bigger city. And so at first I knew I wanted to be in New York and that was my goal. And I was, I'm going to move home, back home to Baltimore, work there, and then I'll be closer to New York so I can travel back and forth. You know, I'll start kind of making that transition. I started working for a small spa there. And honestly, that was kind of my breaking point. I did so well at that spa. And what really helped me do well was my social media. Because the whole time I was in aesthetic school, I started my skincare Instagram. And so I was posting skincare reviews. I was posting skin tips. And one of the main things I was focusing on was treating hyperpigmentation and barrier repair. And those are still kind of the two things that I'm really known for, hyperpigmentation and treating impaired barriers, because that's what I would see all the time in school and clients and all of that thing, all those things. And so as my social media got bigger, clients started coming to see me in Baltimore from D.C., North Carolina, Virginia. People are driving, you know, an hour and a half, two hours just to get a facial from me. And I was always booked. And the the honestly, the spot I was working for, they didn't deserve that kind of energy. They really were they were they were horrible people. But I was booked all the time. People would request me, and I really built my book. And then even as I was seeing the local girls, they would tell their friends about me. And so, like, I had this one nurse. She had a sorority. I literally did every single one of her sorority sisters. And so just off of that one client, I made 12. And it just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And I got to the point where I kind of had to leave that spa. It was just just like the management and things, you know, like it just, it wasn't yeah. working for me. And I realized it was time for me to go on my own because I really cannot work for other people. And even when I work for other people, it has to kind of be on my terms. Yeah. And I ended up leaving and... I didn't have the money to really open up a full space. And so I started to do virtual consultations, which is like the first time I ever did those. And so all of my followers who wanted help, we would do Zoom, email. I would have them tell me what they were using, write them like a two-page treatment plan, help them kind of figure out their skin. And people were getting good results. I was clearing people's acne, helping them lighten hyperpigmentation just virtually. And I took all of that money, started my LLC, opened my business. My friend at the time, Lily, she was like, basically she lived in Jersey and she was like, she really wanted to open up a spa. We had both just graduated aesthetic school. And she was like, would you be open to doing this with me? And I was like, No. (laughs) Like, are you fucking crazy? Opening a business in New York at the time, like I was making decent money, but like I was living in my grandmother's house, like in her second bedroom. Like I didn't think I had the the resources to open a successful spa. And I was just, I was nervous. You know, it's New York, it's opening a business. That's a lot. And she honestly gave me the confidence to just do it. And I really, I had nothing to lose. It was like either stay here with my grandma or go to New York and fulfill my dreams. And so I took every, literally every fucking penny I had, I put it into my business, getting my product, getting spa supplies, getting my apartment in New York, because I had to also have somewhere to live in New York, also saving up money to pay my rent for the spa. It was a, it was a lot. And so it was a little spa room, right? I don't want people to think that it was like a 12, you know, room Yeah, it was spa. not like it some was a spa, room. spa. Yeah, we found a place in Long Island City. It was a beautiful building, almost kind of like a co-working space. Yeah. And so it was like, we literally were across the hall from Uber. Okay. But like, we had like a front desk. So like, it was really cool because like, when people would, my clients would come, the front desk would just call me like, hey, someone's here. So it's kind of like I had like my own little concierge. It was a really nice building, but we had a room in like a kind of working space. I know you built this following there, but I mean, there had to be a tipping point because how I was introduced to you and I know a lot of the editors were introduced to you was, you know, through Fenty or your massive Instagram. Like what was that kind of blow up point for you? Honestly, the it was really the pandemic, sadly to say, but... And when I say Fenty, pan- if you could expand on that, because some people might not understand your relationship with Fenty. Yeah. And now because, Dior, too. Yes. Connect all oh, the dots. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so 
it was really like crazy because we had just opened this spa in January of 2020. By March 2020, Oy. the pandemic started to happen and we closed the spa. So I barely had, you know, three, four months of my business. And mind you, I put all my money into this business that was now shut down. What really saved me was my social media because I continued to post, I continued to grow. And during that time, I started working with brands on partnerships like Youth to the People. Polish Choice became a huge partner for me. Till this day, they're still one of my biggest supporters and one of my biggest brand partnerships. What happened was, I think around March or April into the pandemic, I got an email from Fenty Beauty. And they're like, hey, babe, <laughs> um, we <laughs> want to talk to you about some new launches we have. And there have been rumblings about Fenty Skin, but I didn't really think about it because I was like, it's Fenty Beauty. And I thought, you know, at that time, I was kind of doing like little boy makeup tutorials and things like just get ready with me in the pandemic kind of videos. And so I was like, oh, they just want to send me some product. Basically, what happened was they were looking for two ambassadors, just like they have on Fenty Beauty and they have Priscilla and they have Hector to do the makeup. Yeah. They wanted, I'm assuming like a male and a female. And they, I mean, I still don't know exactly who they reached out to. A couple girls told me they reached out to them and then I found they were lying, but that's not that thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so like I know they reached out to like a few people and they submitted all of our briefs to Rihanna and she personally was the one who was going to pick the ambassador because she has to work with us. How long did you work with them on that in that capacity? I worked with Fenty for about a year total. You mentioned Dior. I see you're called the Dior skincare expert, mm-hmm. right? What does this role entail? So it's similar to what I did at Fenty, but completely different as well. I have to say, I really, really love being at Dior. It is truly a dream job. And for me, it really is like a full circle manifestation because in 2017, I wrote in my little manifestation journal when I was in L.A., the two brands I wanted to work for were Dior Skincare and Fenty Skin when we When Rihanna launched Fenty Beauty, I was like, if she ever does a skincare line, I have to be a part of that. And both positions I've gotten. So it's really been like a full circle thing. At Dior, my job is really unique because Dior has never really focused on skincare solely. It's really always been about the makeup, you know, the backstage beauty line the fashion, and even the fragrance. It's never really truly had a focus on skincare. And so my job as a Dior skincare expert is really to bring the skincare to the forefront, educate the client, the consumer. Even the client who's already been using Dior for years may not know like the science behind the products. It's really for me to re-educate, reintroduce the Dior kind of skincare arsenal to consumers. And so we've really kind of been revamping a lot of things. This month, we have all new cleansers launching at Sephora and our other retail partners, which I really love. And we've even brought the fragrance down. It's a much clean, lighter fragrance, new modern packaging. So and we're you really- get to help educate and also consult on that stuff? I get to educate, consult. I get to create educational content. And the best part of it is that I get to also include my facials into it. So I still get to work as a facialist. I get to do all our VIP and celebrity clients like Jess and be able to introduce them to the new Dior and maybe, you know, share some things that they didn't know about the skincare before that I can, as an esthetician, be able to offer my tips on what products to use, how to use them, how to get the most out of them. Because, you know, now you still have your, do you still have client base here in New York City that isn't through Dior? Like you still see your, your people? I do. I get requests to do facials all the time, but honestly, I don't have a space right now. And I don't really know if I want a space. It takes, you know, it's a lot being an esthetician and to do that full time. I yeah. love what I do right and now. As well. Yeah. And so I feel like that's really why I love what I do. I do it because I get to do my facials and connect with my clients that way. Also do my social content. I get to travel and, you know, still be able to talk to different markets and different pockets of the world. You said when you were in Atlanta and Maryland... You were known, and I know this because I followed you, about Skin Barrier 
And I was like, why is Sean always going on about the skin barrier and hyperpigmentation? But you've touched thousands of faces. Is there anything universal with those two issues that you find that you can help people with? Like now that you're not, you even when you do it virtually, how do you help people when you're not touching Absolutely. I think people think skincare is more complex than what it really is. For every client I approach, it's always a basic routine. And then whatever condition your skin is in and whatever concern you're suffering with is how I built out the rest of your routine. I start every- What's the basic then? Because that goes for everybody, right? So I start every client with cleanser, hydration toner, or hydrating serum, a great moisturizer, and a good SPF that you're going to use and want to use every morning. After that, I built in serums that either treat hyperpigmentation, acne, rosacea, things like that. And then, you know, peptides, growth factors, and really build up your skin barrier. So when I was doing clients, because a lot of my clients were um, people suffer from acne in the spa, my approach was always to bring down the inflammation of the acne. Let's control, maintain the acne. Then we can start thinking about things like hyperpigmentation and skin texture, because you can't really... If your skin barrier is impaired and it's not in good condition, so if your skin is dry, you know, you're using two dehydrating cleansers, you're not wearing sunscreen, I can't properly treat your acne because your skin is always going to be in a um, cycle of inflammation. It's just kind of going to be constant. So everybody gets like the Sean reset first. Yeah. So I strip everything. Like dial it back, I rebuild. Let's just do the moisture to start. I rebuild, and it really starts with your cleanser, sunscreen use, and the amount of hydration in your routine. And so I start everyone with a gentle cleanser, a great moisturizer, great um, SPF. I People say like hydrating serums aren't necessary. They are. They are. Why? A hydrating toner and a hydrating Uh-oh. serum, they are. Because those are that. the easiest... Those are the easiest ways to get hydration and skin barrier ingredients into your routine. So like you can get a great moisturizer with ceramides and hyaluronic acid and all of that. But serums are like they're formulated to dive deeper into the skin. Although like even though hyaluronic kind of sits on top of the skin, no matter kind of what any brand says, it does help kind of draw moisture into the skin. And a hydrating tone is just going to help prep that skin for any treatment. Sean, are you talking about the... Moisture sandwich? The moisture sandwich, yes. <laughs> the middle layer of the moisture sandwich? Yeah. So it's like the moisture sandwich really is a gentle cleanser, something that's either milky, low lather. Even if it is something that like foams up a bit, it just needs to be non-stripping, have gentle, hydrating skin barrier strengthening ingredients. And then I love a milky toner, hydrating toner. And then a hydrating serum, something that has like peptides, hyaluronic acid, maybe some ceramides. And then your moisturizer, something that has, again, What are like your go-tos? Because who has these good moisture products? Like, tell us some of your favorites. Well, I love Paula's Choice. The, so Paula's the moisture Choice, sandwich. The, the Yeah, so Paula's Choice has a great and rich calming toner, which I love. It has evening primrose, borage seed, hyaluronic acid, lots of... Like if your skin is inflamed and dry and tight, you need that toner. I love the new Dior cleansing milk. It doesn't foam at all. And so it's a milky kind of creamy cleanser that kind of transforms into an oil, makes your skin so soft. I don't even rinse it off. I take a warm cloth and just kind of let it sink into the skin and then remove it that way because I like to kind of leave some of that moisture on the skin. Then I go in with my hydrating toner. One of my favorite hydrating serums is from PCA Skin. It's so expensive, but it's so good. It has hyaluronic acid, niacinamide, ceramides, cholesterol. It's great fatty acids. It's helping rebuild the strength of the skin. What does cholesterol do? I've heard of that for hair, but what's cholesterol do for your skin? So cholesterol is something that's essential. It's like an essential fatty acid for the skin. So it's helping keep like those collagen bonds together and strong. So to um, stop from like creping and dryness and fine lines. And when you pair cholesterol with ceramides or hyaluronic acid, it really kind of creates that ideal skin barrier kind of serum. I don't have Sean in my bathroom to apply all of this for me, you know? (laughs) Like, does it matter, Mm -hmm. the application technique? Like, what if I buy these three products and I'm just slapping them on? Mm -hmm. Is that going to be okay? No. (laughs) No. Okay. Okay. No. uh, Honestly, like, I I mean, as an esthetician, of course, I apply things in a, you know, very massaged way. I always say... 
go upwards and like, you know, massa- like whenever I apply skincare, it's my little way of Im- implementing massage into my skin because I don't have the time or the patience to really sit and massage my face. So when I apply my skincare, that really is like my mini massage. I would say the biggest tip is to apply your serums and even your moisturizer onto damp skin. The only thing you don't want to apply on damp skin are like your treatment serums, like your exfoliants, and then also your sunscreen. You want to apply sunscreen on dry skin. But having your skin damp, so keeping like a little toner mist in between steps. I love the Caudalie grape water just to kind of keep my skin hydrated in between steps um, because that's going to help the skin, pen- the serums and products penetrate into the skin. And then also just kind of rub your skin in longer, dewy. though. Like no, when I have damp skin, I, I know this tip. Mm-hmm. I've heard this tip. And then I'm like, but now I have to rub longer for it to actually get in my skin. Is that the massage? Like it tricked me into massaging? Yeah, just a little massage. One of my biggest pet peeves is when I'm applying product. You know, we're talking right now about layering. But then sometimes I'll get like a product will start to pill. It'll start to shed. Do you have any tips for that? Yeah, so that happens usually like when certain formulas just don't mix well. So honestly, I feel like if a product pills, like if I can't implement a product into my routine effortlessly, it's something that I just can't do. Sometimes it happens when you have too many layers of skincare on yeah, and the product either like you have something water-based on top of something oil-based, so it kind of doesn't like sit well on top of the skin. It happens a lot with sunscreens and how they're formulated. So usually if that happens, I let to, because it happens a lot with mineral sunscreens. So if I'm applying my skincare, I like to just let that sit in for like maybe 45 to 50 seconds, a minute, just to kind of let everything kind of penetrate and set and then apply like my sunscreen or my moisturizer to kind of avoid that pilling from happening. Right. So also your hands are very, very, they look very well cared for. When you're they're in a lot of your photos too. Yeah, they're in your photos and I think you know they look good. Otherwise you wouldn't put them in the photos. So what are you <laughs> doing? I'm going to tell you what started that because I used to, used to shoot everything with my hands and then people always like, oh my God, you have such beautiful hands. And I was like, wow, like I kind of do. And so it kind of made me like obsessed with keeping them Great. I mean, as an esthetician, like I'm always, you know, trying some serum. So they get a lot of love, probably more love than like the average person because I try so much product. For me to maintain them, I mean, I get manicures every six to seven days. Um, Okay. Those aren't gels? I thought for sure those were gels. These are powder. Okay. And you have a signature color, you said, right? Yeah. I have like a whole system. I'm very, I'm very specific about my nails. So I do dip powder. I don't do the dip top coat. I only do a gel top coat, very thin layer. The color of powder that I get, literally when I walk in the salon, the girls already have it set up because they're like, <laughs> same color. I'm like, T69, girl, you know what it is. And for a long time, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know what color it was, but it's OPI, love is in the bear. It's just like a soft, natural pink, like... I've been getting my nails like this for like almost a year and like I'm still like obsessed with them. It's just, it just looks natural and healthy. I don't really love nail art. I don't love colored nails that much. Sometimes I like a, like a brown or like a nude for fun. But especially as an esthetician, you're just always kind of taught to keep your nails like clean and kind of just, you know, simple, especially for like working with Dior and being on camera and stuff. I kind of want my nails to kind of always look great. But I also mix a little retinol to my hand creams, my body cream. I use retinol, lots of hydrating serums. I use a body serum from Necessaire that I've been using for years now that I slather my whole body and I do exfoliating um, moisturizers. Topicals has this new one called Slather. I put that all on my oh, hands, yeah, my that. elbows, my knees, my ankles, everything. This retinol that you're better. mixing in, you put like a prescription retinol into your hand cream or? I have like three Shawnee Darden retinols. So I have one for my body, one for my face. So I just like do a little I would pop never in. Waste that on my hands, but it's not I wasting. I mean, I- <laughs> your hands got to look good. It's a great benefit. Too. The hands got to look good too. And I want to go bad. So I use it. But if I don't have that, Polish Choice has a great retinol body treatment that's really good. It looks like your butt toned and smooth, your arms, your legs, it's really good. How do you feel about devices? We get a lot of questions about like a gua sha tool, like, you know, a shaver. Uh, yeah. 
All of them. Radio frequency. Are you into that or? I hate a gua sha. Why? It's just like, I just don't enjoy using it. I don't enjoy manual tools. I like to sit there and let a tool do the work for me. So I love a micro. But what about for other people? What about for people who don't have your skills? Like, do you think they're good for, you know, the rest of us? I guess. Mm. I feel, I feel I truly like, like warm. Yeah, I am. Like, I don't like with the gua sha and like the jade rollers and things. I think for me, it's more like, of course it has like benefits in like toning the skin. But if you really want like an at-home device, something like the zip microcurrent or like a really good LED device. I use the one from Current Body. Now get out the big guns. I love my new Thera gun, which Jess, I didn't get to try on you because it launched after. But wait, 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 I wait. used the muscle thing that like vibrates f- your muscles. They have a facial tool. And so when I was in LA doing clients, this is I'm scared already. Tell me what tell I me used it in LA and on clients. Everyone was obsessed with it. I think everyone bought it. I used it on um, Nicola Peltz, now Beckham. She was like gagging over it because it has <laughs> um, <laughs> it has so many different modalities to it. So you can do microcurrent. You can do the actual percussion. And so I put the percussion tool on. So what I love to use it. So I do like, after I do an exfoliating treatment, I'll do a cooling sheet mask to kind of bring down any just any inflammation or redness that might occur during the exfoliation. And then over top of the serum, I'll put on the cryotherapy tool along with the percussion. And so I'll do percussion and massage therapy while I'm doing cryotherapy and really helps the percussion, tone the skin, is that lift like it. The one that looks like your fingers drumming, like it does like a vibrate like you would do with your fingers, but this does it for you. So they have, they have the pointed one, but I like the flat top because it just kind of goes along the contours. And I really kind of focus on the cheeks. I do the neck, the jawline, and I don't do the percussion on the forehead because you have you have more bone than like tish, yeah, fatty tissue no here. Fat. There's no fat. Yeah. Don't do that. Yeah. There's no fat there. So I'll turn the percussion yeah. off and just do cryotherapy <laughs> on there. It comes with a LED device, but I specifically, I love the Light Sim Ellipsa. That's my favorite professional device. And so I'll do my clients 20 minutes under that. We'll massage some um, serums in. I'll use my Dior Rose What kind of light is that? Tools. An LED device? Yeah, it's LED. So it does red, the red blue. light, infrared. Mm. It does uh, blue light, and you can do the mix. I don't like mixing red and blue, though, because it can transfer to UV, and it can actually make hyperpigmentation worse. So you have to be careful with that. Oh, yeah. S- scary. Mm-hmm. Wow. It sounds like... I mean, you've got everything. You've got lots of toys to play with. What are some of your other favorite products right now, like across all categories, makeup, grooming, fragrance, the whole thing? Like what is in your kit? I'm really into fragrance. I think anytime like people meet me, they're like, it smells so good, which is like the best compliment you can get. As obsessed as I am with my face, I'm just as obsessed with my body. Like I really take my body care insanely serious. I dry brush every day. I use a brush in the shower. I do a glycolic body wash. So like body care is my thing right now. So I love the Notorium glycolic body wash. Mm. It's super cheap, super huge. Literally it has smoothed my body better than any product I've ever had, you know, to like get TMI. If you get like, you know, butt pimples or like any kind of like little texture on your body, especially if you deal with like Catoris polaris. I'm sorry. The um, KP. Like KP, yeah, yeah. the chicken skin. It helps with that. It's really, really good. Again, I love the Necessaire body serum, but I love the one from Ice Clinical too. It comes in a spray bottle. It's called the Youth Body Serum something. It's really good. What else do I love? What is this fragrance? Everybody says you smell so good. What are you wearing? But that's a secret. You can't ah. tell people. Oh, one of those people. <laughs> I'll tell you the one. So like, I'm really into Le Labo again right now. So I'm really into Te Matcha, which is like my favorite. It has like these kind of like woody notes, but like a little sweet. And it has like this fig note. So I like to amplify the mm. fig note. So I'll layer Te Matcha from Le Labo with Philocycles from Diptyque. And really oh. get like a sweet, woody, fig, Double earthy fig. scent. Mm-hmm, double okay, fig. Yeah. And sometimes I'll mix Te Matcha with Te Noir from Le Labo as well. I also love Ambre Nui from Christian Dior. I, that's like my date night scent. My summer that's scent from Venus Dior Williams is Eden Rock. Candle. Did you know that? Really? 
Yeah, she came on the show recently and she was like, I bought all of them. And I went online. I was like, they're sold out everywhere. Venus, my like, house is filled up. with... But you wear it as the, as the fragrance on yourself, not yeah, just in your house. My house is filled with Dior candles, though. Oh, it's like it's what I'm obsessed scent. with. Every time I go to the office, every time we travel, I take like a case with me. They're like the best no, candles. No, you don't. You travel I literally with do. candles? Well, they like travel. Size. They travel and I take them. <laughs> 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 All right. Listen, before we let you go, enjoy your life that is going amazingly well right now. Could we do this little fat God mascara five with you? It's like a speed round we do at the end of our show. Yeah, let's do it. Okay, ready? Okay. Mm-hmm. So, Sean, what music do you like to put on when you're doing a facial? If if you do any music. I love like chill, vibey jazz. I'm really into Raven Lene right now. She has a new ha- album called Hypnose. It's just like really sexy, 70s, kind of like r and It's really, really mm. good. Really into her right now. Who is the person you'd love to get your hands on, like for a facial that you haven't given one yet? Probably Zendaya. We follow each other on Instagram, but I haven't gotten my hands on her yet. Also my friend, uh, Ryan Destiny. Mm-hmm. She's actually my best friend, Scott's client. And we always see each other and have like such a great time, but I haven't had my, I want to put my hands on her like beautiful, perfect little face. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite piece of jewelry? Ooh, I just bought two diamond bands while I was in LA as like a little treat to myself. So probably those. And I bought like new diamond earrings and probably like these new Cartier rings I just bought. But you named that was like five. Yeah, but I'll allow it. <laughs> <laughs> I love jewelry. On like that's like my first love, honestly. What was the first piece of jewelry you bought yourself? That's a little side question. Real or just like in general? Real. Real was probably like these little gold diamond hoops I had when I got like, you know, a cute little check. I got a little Fenty check. <laughs> <laughs> a cute little Fenty check. That's funny. That's funny. Okay. What's your favorite indulgent snack? Ooh. Okay. It's these things called Chip Witch. Uh, these so... things called chip witch. Get out of here. <laughs> Wait, are they, knows a are chip they popular? Uh, I didn't know. <laughs> I just, I literally just discovered it like a month ago. Are you kidding? I swear to God. <laughs> they have this birthday cake Closing flavor. Closing this window. Yeah, go on. <laughs> they have this birthday cake <laughs> flavor, but like the ice, the cookie portion is so good. It's like a real yeah. sugar cookie. It's like soft it's a, and like yes. sugary. Yeah. But also, Do you bite I, or you lick around? What's your technique? Girl, I take three bites and I just like <laughs> it's gone. Smash it in my face. It's a three biter for you? No, I kind of savor it. Like I get in bed, I watch hacks, and yeah. I eat a chip witch. And that's oh, how no. I wind down. You no wonder you're like life is good. Okay. <laughs> life is good. Life does not get better. You just describe Listen, Yeah. I'm like, I'm trying to live like Deborah Vance in like real life. Yeah, I get it. I get it. <laughs> If anyone doesn't know what that is, go watch Hacks and Deborah yeah. Vance is living. Um, my, my, chip wi- my chip witch thing. Okay, so you're going to think this is like a little wild. If I have it at home, like if they're frozen in my freezer, because yes, I do stock chip witches at home. They're not just like Same. an outside treat. Okay. Mm-hmm. They're too hard when you take them out of the freezer. So I will, I don't have the patience to let them sit. And like, you know, I don't, I don't microwave. Know that, like, I microwave them for approximately <laughs> seven seconds. <laughs> approximately. Yes. No, no, it's exact. <laughs> to, to ten is too many. You will end up with soup and two cookies. Yes. All right. Let's, uh, oh, my. I can't. Okay. We should have just talked. We should have brought this up at the top. Okay. No, but also the milk bar carrot cake. That's like the best carrot oh. cake I've ever had. And it's limited edition. I've never they had need to bring it. it back. <gasps> so good. It has like a marshmallow cake. fluff of like <gasps> rice crispy. Like little cake. rice crispy pieces in it. So the mm. best carrot cake oh. I've ever had, literally. Oh my God. I okay, I have to be a look at I love carrot cake. Okay. And then last is what is your technique for relaxing when you're stressed? Shopping. Okay. Shopping. Online or in, in or IRL? Online, IRL. I feel so fab, Carrie Bradshaw, when I actually go to a store. I'm just like, you know, throwing my shopping bags over my hand, walking down Rodeo. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but like, I'm an online shopper. I'm an online shopper. Like, and oh, also, but also like furniture. Time. I love like changing things in my home. I just organize my closet, which I'm like obsessed with. It's so, like organizing, shopping, hacks. I love watching random documentaries. 
all those things. Oh, I, your life is beautiful. Your life is great. You have the <laughs> best life. There's a lot of you overlap do. with Jess and my favorite things to do. Yeah, truly. I'm, co- I'm coming over. I'm coming yeah, over. We're, okay. We're going to be besties. I know. This is great. Oh, my God. Sean, I'm so happy you, you came and did this. Thank you. Me too. I'm so happy we got to do it. Oh, I'm happy for your success. It's well-deserved. Thank you so much. We hope you enjoyed the show. It's your reviews and feedback that help us make the podcast even better. Head over to iTunes to rate and review us or email your thoughts to info at fatmascara.com. We also want to answer your beauty questions and hear what products you love. To share a Razor One product review or to ask a beauty question, email us at info at fatmascara. If you send it as a voice memo file, we can even share your voice on the podcast. You can also do that by leaving us a voice message. Our phone number in the United States is 646-481-8182. Thanks so much for listening. 